Hello and welcome to Beyond the 3D. My name is Michael J. Russ, your host. Thank you for joining me for this part two of Turning Lead into Gold, Racism. Where do you go from here? I want to begin this episode with a great quote posted on social media by Kimberly, my friend and avid listener. She said, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. Kimberly, thank you so much for that beautiful quote on your social media. And I had to type it and use it here because it's highly applicable. In part one of my multi-series, uh, multi-part series about racism, focusing on how to turn lead into gold, we focused on how you can begin to, ter- to do that, how you can begin to transform, to take negative and, and turn them into positives with regard to racism. And this is, has to do with the inner work I talked about which I will uh, discuss in more detail in this episode. I also revealed a a universal truth. To create the change you seek in your outside world, you must go within because all external change in consciousness begins from within. It always does. And this is how I believe we're going to change the ending. In part of that quote, change the ending. You can start where you are now to change the ending. With regard to racism, you must go within to emancipate your mind from bias, judgment, prejudice, negative perceptions of supremacy and privilege, and other levels of toxic thinking. If you feel discomfort in any form during this inner work, congratulations. You're making progress. In the immortal words of Bruce Lee, you must convert your negative emotions into some form of useful action. Useful action is here in this case, and with regard to your inner work, that I encourage you to engage in is the work where you assess your personal perceptions about race and class and up your level of knowledge about the black experience in America and the motivations behind why and how systemic racism has been intentionally woven through the fabric of our society, through books, movies, articles, museums, memorials, and historical documentaries. That's what you must do. Look at, look at, look deep. Open your eyes. Broaden your perspective. And start engaging in, in, in more enlightenment. Because for too long we have, you know, lived with our heads in the sand. Just working and acquiring things. And in the meantime, ignoring what's been going on in the rest of the world. You know, one important aspect of the black experience in America can be accessed can be accessed through the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. It was founded two years ago in Montgomery, Alabama by the Equal Justice Initiative. This mind-blowing experiential memorial was recently highlighted in the media and for the second time, actually, and I strongly encourage you to experience it online and visit its magnificent, magnificent space if you have the ability. Um, it, uh, I do because it's going to change your perspective completely. Uh, the website uh, I'm going to list in the, in the uh, d- description here of this episode, but it's museumandmemorial.com. E as in Edward, J as in Johnson, and I as in it, dot org. E, J, I. So that's museum and memorial dot E, J, I dot O, R, G. Pretty phenomenal piece of work. Okay, delve into that and see how that shifts your perspective a little bit. You know, my intention with this episode is to help you focus on thought viruses. That's where we're going to go here in this episode. And we're going we're gonna to take this off on a tangent because thought viruses are huge. Because they reinforce prejudice, racism, supremacy, superiority, and privilege. And because this, be, this, is, this Beyond the 3D podcast is about transformation and transcendence from within, I'll let you know how you can stay on top of these thought viruses and weed them out of your psyche in real time, because that's what the inner alchemy work is. You know, once you understand and up your level of awareness, now it's about actual practice. It's about turning that, that knowledge into wisdom for you, experiential wisdom. You know, and if, you, if you're sincere, really, about eradicating these things that, you know, systemic racism and the like, 
in our society, understanding thought viruses and the way they influence the thoughts, self-talk, feelings, and actions you express about race and class is absolutely essential. So let me begin by giving you a simple definition of a thought virus. A thought virus is a negative thought or idea that you adopt as your own. It's that simple. That simple. For thousands of years, thought viruses have been misleading, instilling fear, ensuring compliance, influencing perceptions, and shaping biased behavior. For example, just the other day, in the People's White House Rose Garden, the President of the United States engaged in a full-on spread of thought viruses by making statements lined with racial overtones designed to sow fears about what will happen if Democrats are elected. I'm not saying this to be political. I'm simply saying that Thought viruses are spread by people you respect or should respect. Myths, stereotypes, false notions, and hidden biases owe their origin to thought viruses. Let me give you two more examples. In January of 2020, in the article published by the AAMC, an expert looks at how false notions and hidden biases about black patients led uh, to them being treated differently when it comes to receiving pain relief. This just blows my mind. She writes, half of white medical trainees believe such myths as black people have thicker skin or less sensitive nerve endings than white people. And this, inf- this impacted the level of, of pain reliever that they were giving black people in hospitals. In a paper published in the October 2019 Journal of Public Health by Rana Asali Hogarth, Ph.D., titled The Myth and Innate racial differences between white and black people's bodies. Lessons from the 1793 yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This uh, particular article addresses the question of why beliefs in fundamental innate racial differences between black and white people's bodies persist in medical discourse despite evidence to the contrary. She says, during that early period, early public health crisis, Dr. Hogarth says, white physicians and lay people erroneously thought that black people were immune to yellow fever because of their race. Regardless of the medical circumstance, the thought virus is operating at the heart of each of these two examples, these these two articles, is black people are physiologically different from white people. You just imagine someone saying that. And someone propagating that in their writings and in their talks. And people start to believe it. And how it then impacts their own inner conversations, the thoughts they have, their perceptions about black people, and their feelings. And then their actions or responses as a result. That's what I'm talking about. The thought virus is huge. To get thought viruses going, you only need two things, someone to spread it and someone to start believing it. After becoming infected by it, the speed and convenience of the Internet and social media today can act as an accelerant and spread it like wildfire. In today's world, people have sidestepped reason and just believe what they see on the Internet when it corresponds to their current perceptions, which is why it's vital that each of our perceptions regarding race undergoes an examination so they can be realigned to manifest a change in our conscious awareness that makes a real difference at the root level of systemic racism. And that's the policies, the procedures, the laws, the things that the, 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 the banker who's uh, in charge of giving loans for their institution, at that level, that is where we must go. The higher interest rates paid by people of color than white people on loans, on the same exact loan. Being shut out of certain institutions because of your race. Because of your perceived socioeconomic bias. Thought viruses spread disinformation, sow distrust and Division, ignite fear, doubt, anger, confusion, shape public opinion, and continue, continue to reinforce, reinforce untruths for generations. So it's up to you to remain vigilant about confronting and eradicating thought viruses. That's your inner work in this episode. Perceptions last episode, 
Thought Virus is this episode because they support and reinforce your perceptions. You didn't come out of your mother's womb programmed with thought viruses, programmed to think you're perhaps inferior or that someone else is superior. You became infected with thought viruses over time as you were exposed to information, experiences, events, and people. Did you ever think a black president would ever be elected here in the United States? Do you think a woman or person of color will ever be elected president? Do you think law enforcement officers in general are biased, prejudiced, or purposely targeting people of color and blacks? Do you think there is inherent bias in the hiring practices in public and private sector which benefit white men over other candidates? If you're white, do you think blacks are loud? If you're black, do you think whites are out to hold you back or to get you in some way or to discriminate against you in some way? If you're white, do you think black people speak in a certain way? We must all face an ugly truth. That's all of us. Black, white, brown, pink, red, blue, doesn't matter, silver. If we're to move forward and perform the transformation which has been necessary for quite a long time, the truth is we all harbor negative perceptions about human beings that don't look, dress, or act like us, and our inaccurate and biased perceptions are responsible for perpetuating the very inequality, bias, prejudice, and systemic racism you are hoping to eradicate. The number of thought viruses emanating from negative perceptions about race could fill volumes. So don't think this is going to happen overnight. This sort of thing is not expedient. It didn't happen overnight, not gonna not gonna go away overnight. Thought viruses run our life. And if you question that, the next time you watch television, and you see the commercials, I want you to be thinking about thought viruses when you're watching commercials because that's what they're looking to do, supplant a thought virus in your head. That's the most successful ad is the one that actually gets to supplant that thought virus in your mind. You aren't going to be happy without this. You won't be successful without this product. You won't be able to be healthy without this product or that product. These are thought viruses that are spread. And they're very subtle. It doesn't matter what it is. You, you Drug companies are just have these two-minute ads, and they tell you how great you're going to feel. Everybody's dancing in the background. Some of these thought viruses that they're actually implanting or supplanting in your subconscious are, um, <laughs> man, they're insidious. People are dancing. People are having a good time. Hands are in the air. You know, they're happy. And along the way, They have to tell you all the bad side effects that occur. However, after that, they tell you some good news. So plan another thought virus about how great you're going to feel when you take this thing. Start looking at ads differently. When you recognize them for what they are, for what they're pushing, and the the secret message, the, the message, the thought virus that they're looking to supplant in your mind, that is to impact you emotionally, you will see them differently and they will no longer have the effect on you that they've been having. Have you seen the movie Hidden Figures? This inspiring movie details negative racial perceptions and the thought viruses that were supporting them among blacks and whites during the 1960s. Fortunately, it's a brilliant telling of of how perceptions about the intelligence of black people at the time were transformed. The transformation in perceptions and the elimination of the thought viruses as a result of that enabled some really brilliant black women to participate in the success of the space program in the 1960s. Brilliant women, brilliant mathematicians and and, uh, computer geniuses, because it was the beginning of the computer era. You know, as a community, as a community, committing to becoming more enlightened about the dark history of race in this country and intentionally gauging in contrasting experiences with blacks and people of color or condition is where you begin. This is where we all begin. When you relationally connect with someone, discovering they have 
desires very much like your own, it becomes harder to retain negative perceptions and sustain the thought viruses that reinforce them. It does. Once you get to know someone, it makes it harder to hate them. If you're white, let me draw you a picture of how thought, thoughts, feelings, and actions could be contaminated by thought viruses. I'm going to describe a couple of situations, and I want you to, to be cognizant of the first perception that enters your mind for each of them. And I'm going to talk about the corresponding thought viruses, and I'm going to repeat this for um, blacks as well, if you're a person of color. Here's the first one. If you encounter a black man dressed in an urban style with a black hoodie, black baggy jeans, expensive-looking athletic shoes, and a backwards or truncated hat, what do you think? What's your perception? What goes through your mind? The corresponding thought virus to this is blacks who dress like that are dangerous. You might not say it out loud, you might not think it, but subconsciously, it's imprinted there. Second one, you encounter a van full of Latino men at a store or gas station. Hmm, what goes through your mind? What perception do you have when you see that of Latinos? Thought virus that could correspond with that is most Latinos are illegal or taking jobs, good paying jobs. Fourth one, third one, excuse me, a fully qualified black job applicant shows up for their interview and they're in a wheelchair. Here's two possible perceptions, right? That they're black and that they're in a wheelchair. The corresponding thought virus could be very simply. Physically disabled people are not as capable as non-disabled people. Start thinking about all the, 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 the OSHA rules and regulations and the, um, that you have to start paying attention to. Wondering if your place is, is um, compatible for disabled people. Those thoughts shouldn't be going through your mind. You should be focused on the capability of the person to do the job for which you are looking to fill, right? However, thought viruses do enter your mind based on the perceptions you have about what you're seeing. Here's the next one and the last one. The person helping you in a department store is a transgender black woman. Hmm. Here's the possible cor corresponding thought virus. There is something wrong with people who identify as LBGTQ+. I've known, pe I know people actually who've said that. Something wrong in the head with somebody like that. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of perceptions and, and, and thought viruses that support those perceptions going around about the LBGTQ plus community. Now, let's just, if you're black, person of color, you think your mind is free of thought viruses, involving race, ponder these questions. You're the only black, black person or person of color in the room. Hmm. What's the perception that you have if you're in a room of white people, white men and women, for perhaps your job or a convention or something? Maybe you're in a restaurant. You're the only black person or person of color in the entire restaurant. Number two, the person helping you get a loan and every other person in the bank is white. There are thought viruses about this. I'm in a place where there's nobody who looks like me. Am I going to get a fair shake? The person interviewing you for the job that you really want and are absolutely qualified for is a white male. Thought viruses that black people and people of color have is, am I going to get a fair shake or I'm not going to get a fair shake? There are thought viruses, perceptions of this, and then thought viruses that enter your mind based on perhaps past experience, perhaps based on what somebody told you. They might have supplanted the thought virus that, hey, you're never going to get a fair shake under those circumstances. You might as well just, you know, forget about that. The last one, you've been pulled over by a white policeman. What are your perceptions? What are the thought viruses that would run through your mind under those circumstances if you're a black person or a person of color? I said in my last episode, I believe I've been pulled over down here in North Florida twice, once by a local policeman and once by a uh, Florida highway patrolman. And both times, I was completely 
in the wrong. Completely broke the law. However, I must say, the first thing that went through my mind was not, hey, this is a white cop pulling over me and I'm black. Oh my gosh. That wasn't the first thing that went through my mind. I recognized that I must have done something wrong. Just wanted to know what it was. Admitted to it. Cop to it. Took responsibility. I guess I got lucky. Maybe. Did I get lucky? I don't, I didn't have, and I never have those perceptions. My perception is I'm, I'm being pulled over by a cop. I'm going to get a ticket because of this. I've done something wrong. The second time I was simply speeding 20 miles over the speed limit. And a whole host of other things went wrong, as I described in the episode. A whole other host of other things that I could have been ticketed for. I could have been taken to jail, quite frankly, if that person had a bias of any particular kind or just wanted to give me a problem. Call me lucky. However, I don't have the perception in my mind. I don't have a preconceived idea of how a police stop is going to go. Am I polite? Yes. I just see myself as just another person this cop was pulling over that day. When encountering these kinds of circumstances, being black or white, we have been conditioned to engage with them through the lens that is clouded by negative perceptions and thought viruses. That we have. I'm often the only black person in the room, by the way. Often, always the black person, the only black person in the room, wherever I go in the world, around the country, because I seek out this environment in order to continually expose myself to life's contrasts. There are no barriers for me. I'm going to be there. You know, my parents taught me to stretch beyond what I thought was possible and envision myself capable of succeeding in any situation or circumstance without hesitation. I was on a cruise ship about four years ago, a very high-end cruise ship, and it was full of a lot of people who had money and a lot of more white, practically all of them, quite frankly. Didn't bother me. I didn't act any differently. I engaged. I met people, learned about them. They learned about me. I enjoyed the heck out of it. You know, during our, during our encounters with Chinese people in Taiwan, in the, in the mid-60s. We were out, when we were out and about, and you kind of have to put yourself in this situation. I'm in a country called Formosa, just became Taiwan, and um, actually it was about to come Taiwan. At that time, I don't think it was Taiwan. But we're in this, we're in this small, on the small island, not in the main capital. It was on the west coast, Halfway down, it's called Tainan, Tainan, Taiwan. Now, it's completely different now because this is, you know, 50 years later. However, uh, or 40 years later, 40, 40, 50, we're 20, 2020. And this was 1965. And the fact is that we were the only, we were one of the only black families in that city. My father was an officer. He was a captain at the time. And we were stationed there. It's going to spend two years in this country. And when we were out and about in the town, people would giggle. The Chinese people would giggle. They'd come up to us, rub our skin, and want to touch our hair because they had never experienced a live black person before. They'd never seen one. Now, can you imagine yourself if you're black and you're in that situation? Can you imagine yourself if you're white and you're in a situation where the only white person in uh, a village somewhere where you're visiting in some country? You know, there, they, there are preconceived ideas perhaps that they have based on advertising, and I can tell you that's exactly the case. That was the case when we were there. You know, the first time this happened, though, my mother, a pillar of, of experiential wisdom, said, be careful how you respond to their actions. Do not get mad at them or lash out. Don't get angry. You're the first, at the time, it was the 1960s, you're the first colored person, she said, that they've ever seen and they are not laughing at you. They don't even know you. They're just curious. You're an ambassador for your race, and how you respond to their inquisitiveness, she said, will be the impression they have of black people for the rest of their life. Now, I've told this story before, and it's, it's, it's striking. You ask yourself to put yourself in that position where the, you're the only one. People are coming up to you going, hey, you know, touch your hair, rub your skin. Does that come off? 
How did you get that curly hair? What is, what's going on here? Her wisdom has served me well as I've traveled the world as the only black person for miles in any direction in many cases. I assumptively and confidently command respect, and if I don't get it for some reason, I do not immediately assume it's because I'm black. Although it could be. I don't know. I really don't care, personally. There's often some other underlying reason for the behavior in many cases, and I address whatever this behavior is with love, kindness, empathy, and compassion. As a sovereign individual, I'm constantly aware that in order to continue my personal evolution and transform my feelings in real time, it's up to me to continually turn lead into gold personally, which is what I encourage you to do. By focusing on what you can control, your thoughts, feelings, self-talk, and actions in every moment. We'll get more into the sovereignty thing because sovereignty is incredibly important, just a little bit. Now, you've got a thought virus. How do you get rid of it? How do you deal with it? You know, as a podcaster, it will, it will come as no surprise to you that, as a podcast listener, that inner alchemy, which is what I talk about all the time, is a transformative process that will be most helpful for eliminating thought viruses from your psyche. Inner alchemy. That's the inner work, inner transformation at all times. You're always looking to transform the way you think. If you're not, you're not evolving You're not transforming as a human being, as a human soul. You have to continue to be aware of what you're thinking, what you're saying about yourself. Because if you're not, you're not going to be able to recognize when you're off, when you're off beat, when you're missing a step. The element that's going to be most helpful to you in eliminating thought viruses is your own self-awareness. Bruce Lee Who's, I came across a bunch of his quotes just recently, and I love them. Bruce Lee once wrote that there are three forms of awareness. Awareness of self, awareness of in, of in between, and awareness of the world. You must elevate your awareness to the point where thought viruses become unable to hide in plain sight. You want to be repelled by them so they have no chance of getting a foothold in your psyche. If you become aware that your thoughts, words, feelings, and actions are being influenced, guided, or subconsciously directed by a thought virus, a thought or idea that's negative, that you now, for some, because of your own awareness, realize is false, invalid, or just plain ridiculous, if you've committed yourself to think and act from sovereignty and control, you know you have the power to reject it the power not to accept it, or if you have it, the power to transform it. That's what this podcast is about. I'm just simply taking what what I've been talking about for the last two, three years and simply applying it to the racial injustices that we're all looking to change at this point. The systematic racism, uh, inequality, uh, economic, socioeconomic, however. You know, we have a, we have a problem. How do we deal with this problem? It's not them. It's not something outside of me that is the problem that needs to change. We as a society, society is us. <laughs> society is us. It's a collective consciousness that keeps this uh, ridiculous ball rolling. This ridiculous ball of, of racism, systemic or otherwise. Bias, prejudice, superiority, privilege. That's what we're looking to change. We have to do that from the inside out, not outside in. Let's say someone you had uh, trust and respect for early in your childhood kept telling you black people are inferior and you will always be better than they are. If you're white and you had somebody do that, and listen, I live in the South, that, that is a, a, a definite thing, <laughs> okay? And it's not just here. It happens in other places in the world too. That person of color, that indigenous person, you're better than them. And you'll always be better than them. They're always going to be where they are. There are only two scenarios that's going to, that are going to play out here. If someone, if someone supplanted that thought virus in your head, you buy into their, number. this is number one, scenario number one, you buy into their thought virus with every fiber of your being, and this will be a lot easier. It's going to be a lot easier, of course, 
if you'd never developed a relational connection with a black person or a person of color or an indigenous person. If you, it, this is the way it works. If you are an island, on an island, and it's just you, a bunch of white people, and there's black people on the other island, and you've never visited the other island, you've never connected with anybody on the other island, and someone tells you on that island says, you grow up hearing that that island is full of, uh, of people who are, um, you know, you hear a bunch of bad things about them. Those bad things that they're telling you are thought viruses that are supporting the idea that they're bad people. They do this, they do that. They're headhunters. You know, they eat brains of whatever. I mean, whatever it could be. That's the first scenario. You're going to buy into it, hook, line, and sinker, because you don't know any differently. You don't have any contrasting experience. The second scenario is you question the validity, validity of the thought virus and do not allow it to take hold in your psyche because you've developed relational connections with black people or people of color or indigenous people and have had experiences contrary to what you're being told. In other words, if you had secretly, if you'd secretly left your island in the middle of the night, went over, and you were a kid, and you met another kid on the beach over there of a different color, different race on the, from the other island, and you found out that they were just like you, they just wanted to have fun, and you played together during the night, and then you got back in your canoe, and you went back to the other island, and everybody on the other island kept talking badly about the other people, would that thought virus be able to take hold now based on the contrasting experience that you had with somebody from that island? No. No, because you'd had an experience to the contrary. And this is the problem. In this country, in the United States, the average person never travels 75, more than 75 miles from home their entire life, their entire existence. We have a huge country with 50 states. One of them slung 3,400 miles out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Another one, way up north, bordering the Bering Strait in Canada, called Alaska, by the way. So we've got territories in Guam, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Commonwealth, of Puerto Rico. You have preconceived ideas and notions about all of these places, even though you've never been there. When you travel, when you see people in their own element and you connect with them, thought viruses about those people, about that race of people, have, are less likely to take hold. There were, back in the early 2000s after 9-11, a zillion thought viruses floating around about Islam, people who are Muslim, Muslim faith. Still are, quite frankly. Still are. And it's become problematic here in the United States. People, if you don't travel more than 75 miles from home, you've never met somebody who's Muslim, you're going to believe every thought virus, likely, that believe every thought virus that you're being told by someone about someone who's Muslim. You're going to read it in the paper, you're going to read it in your favorite magazine, you're going to read it online in some blog that you, that is, is uh, believes the same way you do. That's the way it goes. Other elements of inner alchemy that would also be helpful for eliminating thought viruses are the element of receptivity. If you're not receptive to the idea that you're engaging with life through the lens of a thought virus, then you are doomed to continue doing just that. Just because you discover that you are doesn't mean that you have the impetus to evolve beyond it. You have to be receptive receptivity. Now, I mentioned that there are, there are 17 different elements of alchemy that you can mix and match in your little imaginary bowl, so to speak, in your, in your mind to move past an impediment of thought, a negative perception. You use these elements to transform. These are elements of inner alchemy, inner transformation. This is the inner work that you're doing, right? Just putting all this together for you. The element of receptivity is one of them. It's a huge element. If you're going to sit in your own little enclave and not be receptive to the fact that you actually have a thought virus so that these exist, then you're going to basically be doomed to staying right there, doing what you're doing. 
The second element that can help you is the element of personal responsibility. Because you must accept responsibility for having a thought virus because you can't change what you refuse to own. You have the virus. You're receptive to changing it, of course, right? You have to take responsibility for having it and sit there and say, oh, no, I don't, I don't think that. Right? Not going to be possible to change it unless you can admit that you have some bias, some prejudice, some uh, feeling of superiority, some feeling of privilege. Not going to be able to change it unless you accept that it is there in some form, to some degree. This is on both sides. Blacks, people of color, indigenous peoples, LGBTQ+, plus. There's, there's thought viruses that are operating on both sides. There's negative perceptions that are operating on all sides. We have to take personal responsibility for them, for our thoughts that have led to our actions, our responses to other people. Then when we own it, we can now take, we can change it within ourselves, which is going to have an impact on our outer world, the people around us. Our attitude will be different. Our vibration will be different. Don't talk a lot about vibration, but this is all about vibration. It's all about, it's all about what you resonate from within, from your heart and mind. The element of contrast is huge when it comes to thought viruses. And I just gave you an example of that with the two islands, right? Seeing every side of an issue, person, place, or thing will give you an expanded perspective that you can apply to eliminate a virus. That's it. If you find you have a thought virus about somebody, about certain kind of people, go engage with them. Go engage with them. You'll find out they're just like you. They want to be happy. They want to work. It's something they love to do. They want to party. They want to have a cocktail. They want to have a beer, whatever. The element of perception. Talked about this in the last episode in part one, mostly. That's what it was about. Perception. Thought viruses reinforce negative perceptions. So being intimately aware of any negative perceptions about purses, places, persons, places, things, and life experiences, then transforming these perceptions will also impact the validity of thought viruses. Back to my little island thing. See how that comes together? You're on an island. They're on an island. You have perceptions about that island, stories you've heard from somebody growing up who had negative perceptions about that island and then spread those perceptions and, and thought viruses that support them to everybody on that other island, on their island. You see how this all can go astray, and it can all be corrected by interacting with the other island, getting to know them, starting to live in harmony, starting to do some trade together. Instead of demonizing, each could be demonizing the other. And that can go on as long as you don't know someone. I've talked many times about traveling around the world and living and going to three different high schools and how the people who uh, I met when I, when I arrived, because I had a different outlook on life. I'd, been, I'd lived around the world. I'd spent time in, in two other high schools, high schools, big high school, small high school. I came with a different perspective. I was engaging with people who'd never left their own city or, again, 75 miles away from home, max, and they're in high school. So they have various perceptions about other people who don't live, don't, who, who, who weren't from their area. And these perceptions get changed when you get to know them. The element of forgiveness, the element of forgiveness is huge. You can see how this plays out. You've got to be receptive. You've got to accept personal responsibility. You've got to experience more contrast in your life. And you've got to forgive yourself for having a thought virus. After exposing yourself to the existence of that thought virus, making sure it's gone for good is essential, and the intimate act of self-forgiveness is indeed the way to go for doing this. If you've taken personal responsibility for operating under the guise of a thought virus, this step is going to be very easy to undertake. 
This is all flows together. It all ties together. It's like a woven, it's like a, like a beautifully woven, woven tapestry. All of these elements flow together. And this, these elements contribute to your transformation. And this is a continual process, a continual process. It's not a one-time static thing. This is the way you live. You live being receptive, personally responsible. You live embracing contrast. You live knowing that you have preconceived ideas, perceptions about things, and challenge those perceptions. And when you find yourself engaging in a thought virus that's supporting a perception that you no longer, that you, that you no longer want, you shift the perception. The thought virus f- fades away. You forgive yourself for having it, having had it, for having thought that way. Got to do it. All flows together. Now, the next element is successful response. The element of successful response, which I talk about in my book, Zero Adversity, which is what it's about. Perceive, respond, let go. Those steps. The successful response. Here are two, there are two successful responses to any event or circumstance. The one which applies to the element of thought virus is as follows. If some action on your part will have a positive impact, you must take action. If you become aware that you are operating under the auspices of a thought virus because of a negative perception, you must take action to eliminate it because it will positively impact your personal evolution and transform the world around you. It'll also make you feel awesome. It'll make you, make you feel happy, fantastic, glorious, marvelous, magnificent. It'll make you feel amazing. Lastly, the element of self-talk. This is huge when it comes to perceptions. Self-talk is also referred to as your inner conversation. I, these words, these terms are interchangeable. And self-talk is defined as what you think and say about yourself and what you're doing, both in your head and in conversation with other people. Self-talk reinforces what you believe to be true about yourself and the most dominant thoughts about who you are and what you are capable of. An example of self-talk that reinforces perceptions about superiority, supremacy, and prejudice would be, I am better than black people, and, or I am superior to back black people. I am, right? The innate power in this simple statement flows from the words, I am. I am, because when you put the words I am in front of a statement that you're making about yourself or what you're intending to do, you are definitively stating who you are in that present moment. As a side note, I should also say that when you state who or what you are not, you're really saying who and what you are. Let me be specific about this because I hear this a lot in this present environment. For example, if, if you were to say, I am not a racist, by stating what you are not, you are saying what you are because in this case, your mind does not understand the word not. I am not. If your mind were a computer, which it is, Would you program it to give you the result you wanted to avoid? Would you program program it to tell you to give you what you're not? What you don't want? Of course not. You would be precise and program it to give you the exact result you were looking for. The correct self-talk in this example would be to clearly state who and what you are, what you stand for in the moment, as in, I am for equal rights for all. I am this, I am that, not I am not this, I'm not that thing. Put a slash through the word not every single time. Just like when you say, I don't do that. Put a slash, put an X right through the word don't. Don't. It's not I don't do that, it's I do that. Why don't you just say, I do this. I am going to do this. I am this, I am that. Not I am not that. I am not this. 
That's why you get so much pushback when you say I'm not a racist. Thought viruses quietly work, work their way into your psyche and operate under the radar, subtly impacting your thinking, your feelings, your self-talk, who you are and what you believe you can do, and any actions and responses that you make. And their power and ability to shape the way you think, how you feel, what you say about yourself and your responses to life should never be underestimated. They're absolutely everywhere. Feelings of inferiority result from someone giving you a thought virus, saying you're inferior in some way. Someone said something that you bit in, you bought off on. Now you feel inferior because of it. Body shaming is spreading thought viruses. When you don't feel good about your body, it's because somebody told you that either through a commercial, uh, some person, some social media, whatever, told you that you don't fit in. You're not part of society because you look like that. How you look is bad. It's a thought virus. When you have sovereignty, when you own your mind, body, and spirit, hook, line, and sinker, so to speak, in fishing terms, when you own who you are, you know who you are, those kinds of thought viruses can impact you. They just bounce off like you got a force field. It's up to you to remain vigilant, recognizing that thought viruses, when they appear, recognize them when they, when they appear and doing everything you can to prevent them from getting a foothold in your mind. And you got to be really good at it because they're very sneaky. They're contracted from people that you trust and respect. Sources that you respect and trust. This could be media, friends, family, work associates, or, per, or perfect strangers in prominent positions who you have been taught to respect. Let me give you a little example of, of uh, what I'm talking about. Again, I'm just full of examples. That's why it's taken me so long to put this episode together because I really wanted to tie it into real examples, and I've had to think on that. I'm going to give you a taste of how thought viruses impact your sovereignty and control by igniting fears, anger, frustration, anxiety, and more. And as I do, think about the value of applying the elements of alchemy that I just talked about. Receptivity, personal responsibility, contrast, perception, forgiveness, successful response, and self-talk to counteract them. I've witnessed people who, <laughs> this is going to be interesting, I have witnessed people who refuse to travel to third world countries where people of color are the majority and socio socioeconomic conditions are less than America for fear of being kidnapped or worse, or in some way harmed. This is a real thing. I actually know someone who will not go to third world countries where people of color are dominate and where the socioeconomic conditions are less than America because she does feel, as a white person, that she is going to be harmed. I see black people carrying weapons over their shoulder as more of a threat than white people in a state where open carry is legal. I know people who, white people who think this is the case. Two people standing next to each other, one black, one white, they both have the same weapon. However, there's a perceptive difference, thinking that the black person is going to take action against them. I know people who revel in white heritage of the Confederate flag and when approached, seem confused about the flag's racist history. I've actually had several people down, this is heritage, man, this is heritage. Do you understand that heritage? Do you understand the background of that flag? No, they don't. I know people who get nervous when they see a black person wearing black, a Black Lives Matter hat or t-shirt. There's a perception there. Now, conversely, I know black people who think white people operate from privilege. 
I know black people who think all forms of law enforcement are, are racist and are out to get them. And that's the lens through which they, they, they in, interact with law enforcement. I know black people who think the N-word is only okay to use when they refer to themselves and racist when white people use it regardless of the context. I know black people who think white people in general are preventing them from getting ahead in life. If there's one thing I've learned, it's that when it comes to people, there are no absolutes, absolutely none. No one is immune to thought viruses. They are everywhere and just waiting for you to own them because we're human beings. We're fallible. If you want to relegate racism, feelings of superiority and bias and prejudice and all this to the dustbin of history and manifest a new generation of equality, your inner work has to begin now, right here, through the last episode, part one, and this one, part two. Claim your sovereignty. Take control of your thoughts, self-talk, feelings, and actions. Take responsibility for them. Be alert to how you feel when things happen. When your feelings are incongruent with happiness, love, empathy, compassion, and kindness, dig deeper to discover the perceptions behind these feelings and engage the inner alchemy necessary to transcend the events and circumstances that caused you to feel the way you do and transform your feelings. Mark my words, I'm telling you. If we were balls of white light with different colored auras surrounding our essence, someone would find a way to convince us that their color was superior, their aura, color of their aura was more superior than all others just to suit their own purposes, whatever those purposes may be. This is inevitable when we as a society deny our personal sovereignty and reject their claims. Again, if it helps you draw a picture in your mind, view virus, thought viruses as malware. I love this one. That's how I see it. Thought viruses are malware. And your mission as a human being is to continually keep the malware from corrupting your operating system and warping your human experience. That's the whole idea. My life mission and the essence of this podcast is to remind you constantly that you remind you of what your higher self already knows. That's it. I'm just reminding you of what your higher self already knows, that you possess the innate tools to continually turn lead into gold by successfully responding to events, transforming your feelings in real time, and transcending all manifestations of racism, superiority, supremacy, and privilege as it applies to the context of this podcast. You are already a sovereign, giving you supreme power over your mind, body, and spirit. All you have to do is think think and act on it. Of course, you do have to claim it first. You have already have absolute control over your thoughts, self-talk, feelings, and actions. All you need to do is assume this control. You already possess the ability to transform how you feel. You just need to engage the inner alchemy to make it so. Now, let me be very clear about this. Although I'm black, as you probably well know from my cover photo, my banner my, uh, of, of this podcast. It is my feeling that regardless of what color you are, everyone needs to engage in the inner work to trans transcend the past, transform current feelings and actions, and manifest a new reality where there is equality and prosperity for all, regardless of color, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation. We are all human beings. We are all balls of light with a suit of clothes on. When each of us embraces thought and action from love without condition, kindness, non-judgment, compassion, and empathy, the world will change in a dramatic and miraculous way. Now that's it for this episode. I've run on for about 54 minutes, and I, I hope you've got it. I hope this has been interesting for you. I thank you for listening, wherever you are in the world. And I look forward to your comments and appreciate you sharing this episode with both your personal and virtual connections. You can reach me by email uh, always at inquiry at michaeljrust.com. Inquiry, I-N-Q-U-I-R-Y. Inquiry at michaeljrust.com. 
want you to, as always, take care and be well. Be safe. Be secure. Take care. Bye-bye.